Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We just celebrated uh, the love of the Father. Is there a more profound and determining truth in all of the Bible than the love of the Father? All of you know what kind of love will make a difference in a home if there's a loving father who loves each member of the family and they know it and they feel it. It makes such a difference. On the other hand, we know how detrimental and destructive the toxic relationship that a father can have with the wife, with the children, with the grandchildren. And it's not something that we yearn for, it's not something we want. But we belong to the greatest father in the universe. And Jesus has come to tell us about him. Jesus has come to instruct us about what he's like and what we can do to develop our relationship with him. That's what this Sunday is all about. We just sung about it, but you know what? There's more. The team has sort of a, a package of songs that'll help nourish our relationship, not only to one another, perhaps to our own dad, our own father and grandfather, but to our Father in heaven. And I celebrate that because the greatest thing that I know of in the world, really, is being a father. Today, our youngest son is in court. Uh, he's an attorney, but it's funny. He's at the kitchen table in a suit, but with shorts on, doing his courtroom work for Hillsborough <laughs> County. And he defends the children in court as an attorney. It's kind of a funny thing, but it's pure it's total fun, fancy. Yeah, yeah I mean, here you are in a suit with shorts on. If only they could see the bottom and not the top. Well, we are here to gather together in the name of our Savior to worship His Father and our Father as well. Would you join me for a moment of prayer as we talk to our Father? Pray with me. Pray and affirm what I'm saying, uh, if, if you agree with it, in your own Father. And then let, let there be a big chorus at the end by you saying, Amen. Father in heaven, and this is true, you are the Father from heaven. This is where you make your home. And you have a son who's preparing the way, preparing the way for us, preparing a place for us. But meanwhile, we have much to learn about you. You can be mysterious, an unknown figure. On the other hand, you can make yourself known through the person of Jesus, your son. And so this morning we dedicate and we have formulated and composed a time of worship that is dedicated to you, not only to your glory, but to help us. We are just pilgrims, sons and daughters, trying to figure out how to relate to you and how to be better father, how to be sons and daughters, as well as fathers and mothers. So, so teach us much, encourage us much, too, with your presence. Let every heart here, child, boy or girl, teen, mom, dad, grandparent, let everyone know in some way, Lord, of your great love for them. And let us see the person of Jesus as he instructs us in his word. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's They are. Thank you, Ben and Clan. Would you like me to do the same thing? <laughs> yeah? Should we have a vote on my salary? Maybe to be doubled if I do that or something like that? Some sort of motive or incentive? <laughs> Kids, I have an announcement. After worship, I'm going to be right here. And I've got something for each of you. I've got a big bag of goodies. No adults can partake. Unless you want to put a $5 bill in. No, I'm just kidding. But for kids, I have a big bag of something. So don't run away too fast, all right? Don't scoot out of the parking lot too fast. You won't want to miss the bag of goodies that I've got for you. And secondly, I want to thank those of you who took the time to prepare something for the young men at the Brit Academy. Thank you for uh, taking the time to put something together, a tree, a snack. I'll be bringing them tonight to the Brit Academy. So if you brought them here this morning, that's good. You can bring them here or put them out in the foyer somewhere and um, I'll take them and put them in my car and I'll bring them tonight. So tonight's the night we bring them food, we bring them hot wings, spicy wings, we bring them pizza, and we bring your treats, your homemade treats. And this is a little bit of home, 
away from home. Keep in mind, these young men are locked up. That's right, they're locked up. They're ages 14, 15, 16, 17. Occasionally they get a birthday and they're turned 18, but they cannot have any visitors, even their mother or grandmother, for six months because of COVID. So they're alone. So what we try to do is bring a little taste of home, away from home. And if you are the one who's doing this, you can, be, you can know that you are helping someone receive a little bit of love in a time when they're locked up, separated from their family. It makes a big difference. The reason I know that it makes a difference, the reason I know firsthand, is that I see these young men in different places after they get out. Now, most of them are not from Pinellas. Most of them are from around the state of Florida. Occasionally, they'll see me. Sometimes it's in jail. I'm visiting somebody else. And they'll say, Pastor Cole, you remember me? And I'll say, no. But then they'll remember what? What will they remember? Nothing I said. None of the profound things that I said. What are they going to remember? Food. <laughs> Go figure. They're going to remember the food that you prepared. And that stuck with them. I remember a guy ran by me in the, in the jail. And he said, Pastor Cole, you baptized me. I said, I did what are you doing here then? But, <laughs> and he said, do you still do that chicken stuff? I said, yeah, we still do that chicken stuff. Yeah, but what are you doing here? So, what you're doing is good. It's practical. They'll remember it. What teenage boy doesn't like to eat? Name one. Name one. Doesn't like to eat. Did you raise a teenage boy? I grew up in a family of five boys. There's one thing we could do. And we... Could eat. We could eat a whole cow in one meal <laughs> if it had been prepared. Thanks for listening. If you want to get involved in this and you haven't yet, no problem. But in a month or two, or maybe in two weeks, kind of it's one that's available. If you want to make some cookies, some brownies, uh, some snacks, uh, you know, no one's ever created popcorn balls, but that would be an idea. Uh, anything that a young man you think would eat and enjoy as a dessert, send it. Even if it's not dessert, send it. And if, even if you're not a chef boy RD, that's okay. Try something. Those boys will eat it. I mean, they eat anything. Chocolate covered ants. You know, take an old pair of pantyhose, put chocolate around it, and they'll eat it. Well, maybe not quite, but... Uh, Yes. Anything to satisfy that voracious appetite that teenage boys have. I don't see how they can eat what they do. It's unbelievable the amount of food that they eat in one sitting. And still be able to walk away and speak English. It's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, this is open to guys and gals. But thank you for what you've done. It's a joy for me to give. I tell you what, I get the biggest joy in being able to give. Even better than, than eating the pizza. It's good to have all of our, our guests this morning. We have a few of our own people out. God bless them wherever they are. But thank you for joining with us today. Let's, uh, let's pray. Prayer is not a traditional thing we do. When we gather to pray right before a message, what we're saying, and this is important, what we're saying to God is that we are dependent on Him for His Word to make a difference in our lives. We're telling God, we're not doing this alone. We can't do this in our own strength, by our own prestige, talent, giftedness, education. No, what we're telling God is that this, uh, this matter of sharing the Word is totally up to Him to use the Word and give it wings, give it power, penetrating power, and give us understanding of what is being said so that our lives can be better prepared for this life. So, pray with me. Lord, we, we thank you for the ability to pray. We're, we're not fancy here in terms of our prayer. We're not using big, big words, stained glass words, holy words. We're just talking to you, having a conversation. A conversation with our Father. And it's a conversation some folks here perhaps really don't have. They haven't begun it yet. Maybe they don't know how. Maybe they don't want to. Maybe they got a beef with you because of the toughness of their own life. And they, they're resentful of you. 
Others here just need more instruction on what it means to talk to our Father. We need to get inside your heart and see your heart. I believe that if we get inside your heart and see what your heart is like, we'll be a lot more motivated to talk to you and carry on a lifetime conversation. Now, there's some newlyweds here. And they've discovered that uh, life is not a part of it. They didn't marry Mr. Perfect or Mrs. Perfect. They married a sinner, a human being with flaws and issues, a lot of baggage, some of them. And they really need to be able to pray together as a couple. There's such strength in being able to pray with somebody like a spouse. So the needs are great here. Our needs are great, but when we look at your pantry, when we look at your heart, there's no lack. It's full. Now give us some of that full this morning and let everyone here leave better, more encouraged, greater, under, uh, greater understanding of how to talk to you and greater motivation. Yes. Fill our tanks with motivation. I pray for your glory, Father, in Christ's name. You haven't heard of Henry IV II. You've heard of Henry IV I, but I've heard about Henry IV II. That's the grandson of Henry IV. Henry had a son, one only son, and he died early in life. His name was Edsel. What a name. And Edsel had a son named Henry IV II, named after grandfather. And this grandson became the president of the Ford Motor Company. And this is what he said about why his dad died. He said, I know that my dad, my dad died of cancer, but it's what my grandfather did to my dad that killed him. I know my dad, my dad died of cancer, but it's what my grandfather, Henry Ford, did to my dad that killed him. This is how, how it happened. Henry Ford was an amazing guy, brilliant, smart. And he handed over the company to his son, Edsel, to take over. Problem was, Henry Ford kept coming to the board meetings. And anytime Edsel came up with an idea, a new idea for the Ford Motor Company, something that was better for the employee, something for the better for the public, his father said, no, that's a stupid idea. And he publicly humiliated Edsel every single meeting, berated what he said, trashed his ideas to the point where Edsel would break down in tears at the board meeting, something grown men don't do in front of each other unless it's very, very severe. Henry Ford could not allow the company that he began to be controlled by anybody else other than him. And you could see the confidence level of Edsel in that position just deteriorate. Toxic relationship between father and son to the point that the grandson who saw that said, my grandfather killed my father. Everything that Edsel asked for his father refused to give him. But his father gave him things he didn't want and he didn't need. One of the problems that we have in addressing our father, learning to converse with our father on this journey of life, is that we ask for things. But inside, inside our head, maybe due to the way we were raised, the way our Father treated us, 
We have no idea what's happening in the heart of the Father when we ask Him things. Jesus has been teaching His disciples about what it means to follow Him. And He has covered a couple of important issues. One, He has taught us about what it means to love our neighbor. That's anybody that is in our pathway. Anybody. The people on the road, on the way to work. Our children, our spouse, people at work, our students, if you're a teacher, your players, if you're a coach, they're all your neighbors. And he teaches us what it means to love them. Then he teaches us what it means to love our, uh, to love God. And to love God is pictured with Mary. Mary listens to the feet, or listens to the words of Jesus sitting at his feet. That's what it means to love God, is to be listening to Jesus, listening to his word. So the Father speaks to us through Jesus. But there's another aspect to that, and that's us talking to God. That's part of the relationship. So he's taught, he's teaching us in chapter 11 about how we talk to our God. And he begins with the word, say the word, Father, and speak it. Say the word, speak it out loud, pray out loud. Then in chapter 11, verse 5, he tells us how to approach the Father when we ask for daily things. We went over this last week. So at the cost of a little bit, of a little bit of repetition, with your permission, he has told us that the way that we approach our Father is with shameless boldness. Yes, shameless boldness. And he told a story about the man who visited his neighbor in the middle of the night and asked for three loaves of bread. That takes nerve. That takes audacity. Audacity to go to someone's house in the middle of the night, pound on the door and say, I need three loaves of bread. And Jesus goes on to say, he doesn't come to the door because he's his friend. He comes to the door because of his shamelessness. Literally. But then, in verse 11, 12 and 13, what Jesus does is he helps us to overcome a little bit of worry that we might have when we approach the Father in a shameless way. Like, are you telling me that if I approach my our Father in Heaven shamelessly, persistently, asking for the things that we need in our life, we're like a persistent child that's pulling on our pants saying, Daddy, I need this, Daddy, I need that, that he's not going to turn around and say, Shut up, you're annoying me. Won't that bother the Father? All of you know what it's like to have a child pulling on you. Say, Daddy, can I have this? Mommy, can I have this? Do you have one of those? Right? And what's your attitude? <laughs> I'm so glad you're such a nag. I am so glad that you're such a pest. Please keep doing that. I'm no. <laughs> what what Jesus now wants us to see is that if we keep on approaching him with shameless boldness, you know what? Whatever God gives us is going to be good. And that's the message. It's going to be a good gift. Let's go to the text. Chapter 11, verse 11, 12 and 13. The first two verses, he talks about regular dads. What father among you is how he introduces it in verse 11. What father among you? Or who among you fathers? And he gives two illustrations, which is typical for Luke. He always does two things. He says, which of you fathers, verse 11, which of you fathers, if your son asks, that word has been used through the prayer, part of praying is asking for things, which one of you fathers, if your son, see the family thing? See, it's a family thing? One of your sons asks for a fish. It does. It does. Some people have a little uh, fish sign on their, maybe their car, their body. It's from this word, fish. Fish doesn't mean uh, God, but it, the, the five letters in ichthus uh, mean, uh, by the early church, basically spell out Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. But if your son asks you for a fish, you, the father will not then turn around and give him, what? Well, the word is ophid. Ophid in the Greek text. He's not going to give you an ophid. What's an ophid? Well, in Acts 28, when Paul was pulling wood out of the fire on the island of Malta after there was a shipwreck, it says an ophid 
grabbed onto his hair. What's it over? A viper with fangs and one bite from the ofer, what happens? Well, what should have happened to Paul didn't, but the crowd saw Paul, and they saw this viper hanging from his arm, and they thought he would swell up like a toad and then drop dead. Which one of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, a grouper, for lunch? Remember, he said, give us today our daily bread. So a fish is part of that diet. Dad, I want fish. It is unthinkable for any dad to then turn around and give his daughter or his son a viper. Why? Because the viper is not good for the son, right? We'd end up with dad. Real quick, think about what that means about our father. If he's using that story to talk to us about our father is that we can rely on our Father to give us what? What kind of gifts? Gifts that are bad for us or good for us? Gifts that are good for us, beneficial too. It's unthinkable that any, now there's some dads out there who do some crazy things, but all things being equal, most dads, whether they're believers or not, love their children. I mean, how many of you love to give gifts to your children? Don't you like to do that? Birthday time, Christmas time, if they achieve maybe straight A's or something, or they didn't hit a tree on the way out of the driveway when they're driving the car, give them an award. First time you didn't hit something, yay! And you give them a gift. It's great to give gifts. But the Father gives us good gifts. Now there's a second illustration, just in case we didn't get the first one. And he said, or... Would, if your son asks for an egg, would he give him a scorpion? Do you know what a scorpion is? Have you ever been bit by a scorpion? Well, the viper will kill you, and the scorpion may not kill you, but it will, what? It will sting. Can you imagine a toddler going and saying, Daddy, would you give me a boiled egg? And the dad turning around and giving that child it's on the It doesn't happen. So, what's what's Luke doing? What's Luke doing here about how to talk to our father even though we're shameless in our approach to him? Is the father going to try to play tricks on us? Let's watch what happens. He asks for bread and we give him a snake. That's not the heart of the father, is it? What's the heart of the father like? What he gives us. Do our shameless approach is not acting out of frustration, resentment, self pity. Here's a, here's a father in heaven who gives what? Good gifts. And that provides what? Assurance to us and confidence that I can go to my father in heaven relentlessly, <laughs> not taking no, not taking no for an answer. But pounding on that door, shamelessly, the Father will always give us good gifts. Gifts that are good. Uh, secondly, in verse 13, he then makes the point. He says, therefore, if you, you as plural, if you, my disciples, being evil, I mean, we all have evil within us due to sin, you still know how to good, give good gifts, don't not that. Gifts that are good for you, if you know how to do that, and you're evil, then how much more, he's arguing from the lesser to the greater, if you're that way, and you do good things, and good good gifts, then how much more will your Father in Heaven, who is not evil, but who is totally good, how will He not what? This is a bit mysterious at first. Will He not give you the Holy Spirit to those who what? Ask. Now the Holy Spirit hadn't been given yet. That's not till Acts 2. This is Luke 11. So this was an astonishing, an astonishing promise. The Holy Spirit, you've got to be joking. Really? Yes. Why would he say the Holy Spirit? Why would Jesus say he would give the Holy Spirit? But because the Holy Spirit is what? 
It's the best gift ever for everybody. What? What is the Holy Spirit? Or who is the Holy Spirit? What does it represent in the redemptive program of, of the Bible? What does the Holy Spirit do? And who is it? Well, the Holy Spirit is the life of God in the soul of a man and a woman, a boy or a girl. It's taking heaven and bringing it down and putting it in you. You see, the journey of the Bible is always heading towards the promised land, right? We're always heading towards the promised land. We're heading towards heaven. It's a big, long journey, but here God has reversed the direction. We're not headed towards the promised land where God is. He's put the promised land within us. We are the time. That's why this gift, the Holy Spirit, is the best gift to anyone. Why? Because as Paul will tell us in Ephesians 1, the Holy Spirit, when he comes in, that Holy Spirit is the down payment for our full salvation. It's the deposit. Have you bought a house? Yeah. What did you do to get the house? You paid a deposit. The Holy Spirit is the deposit in us saying the transaction is going to happen. It's God's way of saying it's a done deal. That's why it's the best gift ever that, that God would give us. So, what Luke is doing for us here is transforming our attitude about how we talk to our dad, our father in heaven. He's changing the way we think about it. He's not going to look at you and say, oh, you again? I thought we just had this conversation yesterday. You know, it's like the guy who got married, and on the day he got married, he told his wife he loved him, and he says to her, you know what? I told you on the day we were married that I loved you, and if anything changes, I'll let you know. Uh, the father's approach. What Jesus wants to encourage us here is to have this daily, moment-by-moment, -moment, lifetime conversation talking with God, talking with our Father. And to do it in such a way that what well, we know, that we can rely on Him and depend on Him. Never to play games with us or play tricks on us. He's never in a bad mood. He's not going to treat you in a condescending way as if we are unequal to Him. Of course we are unequal to Him, but He doesn't treat us that way. He treats us as sons and daughters, not as gifts and things and pieces of property. He treats us as children. And if you are a good parent, then how much better is he as a parent when we come to him and ask for things? Wow, what an incredible father. If you have not learned to pray, if you've not learned early in your conversation with God to pray, if you don't pray with your wife, this is not a guilt, a guilt trip, folks. No guilt. But let me, let me just share the reality of life. Life is hard. Life is full of nasty surprises on this journey. Life is not a piece of cake. The bakery will tell you that, but life is not a piece of cake. Life is hard. Things are ahead of all of us that we didn't plan on, we didn't want, we don't want them, and they happen. That's not the time to start learning to pray together with your spouse or even learn to pray, period. That's not the time to do it. The time to do it is early, early in life. I grabbed in my college days an old little five by seven, little three ring notebook. I still have it on my, my prayer place every day. And that was a long time ago. So when I was in college, I just started writing things down to pray for them. I still, I still use that every single day. And it's been many, many years. And I'm telling you, it's one of the things that I am so glad I did because life has been hard. Life has been filled with many disappointments. And I take those disappointments and give it to the Father. And I'm always confident, maybe not as confident as I should be, but I'm confident that what I get in return is what? Good. Now, before I go to some takeaways, we need to do, we need to listen for a minute. Can you hear the echo? Can you hear the echo? Well, probably not, and that wasn't meant to be intimidating. Where is Luke getting this? 
And where is Jesus getting this information? Where did he find that when the Father gives gifts, they're good gifts? Where did he get that? He got it from where? Genesis 1 and 2. Well, in spite of what you've been taught, Genesis 1 and 2 portrays a loving Father getting a home ready for two people, Adam and Eve. And what does he do? He prepares a place to live. It's secure. It's got plenty of food, plenty of water. He gives them a purpose to worship and serve. He gives them something that's good, a wife, right? It's a father looking at what he is preparing for this couple and saying, it's good. It's good. It's good. And then finally, it's very good. It's good, good. Right there is a picture of God preparing a home for his kids. And that's what Jesus is telling us, that we can converse with that same Father as he gives us things that we need for life. Now, let's think about how maybe we can take this home. Instead of simply being a little bit of teaching on the Father gives good gifts, which is good, let's bring it home. These are the things that come to my mind as I think about this passage. Perhaps they're germane to your life. I hope so. First thing that came to my mind is I know some people struggle with anxiety in work. It's due to perhaps your personality or your upbringing. Not sure. In your case. If you know, if you know that your Father in Heaven is only going to give you good gifts, gifts that are good for you, beneficial for you, helpful to you, and that characterizes every single day of your life, and it's never wavering. He never gets a B on his report card. He always gets an A plus in terms of giving us the things that we really need that are good for us. Can you not trust your Father for tomorrow? And for the day after that, can you not trust him? Do you have any reason to be anxious about your kids or anxious about what might happen tomorrow? I would suggest that you take your fear and have a conversation. Let that fear have a conversation with this passage. Let him talk to you. Let this passage in the truth of the Father talk to those anxieties and those fears. Let him sit in a chair and listen to the truth of this passage about your father. The second thing that comes to my mind is, I know it's a reality for, for Christians never to pray. I, I understand that. Go to church, read the Bible, but some Christians really never pray. They never pray. And rather than guilt tripping you, I don't want to do that. I want you to look ahead. You have no idea what's coming on the fight for you. You have no idea. Jesus knew ahead of him was Calvary. And he pocketed his life and ministered his prayer. Learn to pray today. Start praying. Just have a conversation on the way to work, in the car, or walking. Maybe you're doing your walking exercise. Begin learning to pray to your dad in heaven. Just have a conversation. No platitudes, no stained glass boys. You don't have to sound churchy, wear a robe, all that silliness. Just talk to your mother. Have a conversation. Talk out loud. And learn to talk to him. Learn to listen for his voice. Now while you're young. Because it's, it's going to be so hard for you to be able to hear comfort and encouragement if you've never learned to pray. And then you run into trouble. And you will. That's the way life is. And that's why the Father wants you to develop that conversation now. Third, do you have people in your life who are not walking with Christ or are not believers? Do you have anybody in that category? Why not begin asking God to give them the Holy Spirit? This Bible says what? <laughs> that whoever asks for the Holy Spirit, it will be given. I'm going to suggest that it would be a good idea to 
pray that your son, your daughter, your grandchild, your friend, your spouse would be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And surely that will revolutionize, at least begin to revolutionize their life. Ask God, ask the Father to give the Spirit to those people. Last. One thing that came to me as I meditated on this passage is that Jesus is recommending his dad. He's recommending his father to other people. He is saying, hey guys, you're following me? You know what you can do? You can talk to my dad. Because he'll listen to you. And not only will you he listen to you, he'll give you good gifts. I thought, you know what? I wonder if somebody could recommend me. Could your children and could your spouse recommend you, dads, to other people saying, yeah, you can talk to my dad. You can talk to him. He won't get mad at you. He won't get insulted by things. He won't feel sorry for himself. He's not full of himself. He doesn't even think he's a hero. You can talk to him. I think that would be a great testimony, don't you think? If someone in your family said, yeah, you can go talk to my dad. He's faithful, he loves God, he loves God's people, he's always faithful to worship God and serve God. I would hope that all the fathers here could say, yeah, people will, will recommend me. My son will recommend me. My daughter will recommend me as someone that others can talk to. Because he's a good example. He's a good example of a godly man who takes the Christian life seriously. He has a prayer life. He has a worship life. Something to think about for our own perspective as fathers. Some years ago, I met a judge in this county. And uh, when I got to know him, I asked him if he would come down to the Brit Academy and speak as a judge to these young men. Some of the young men there in the prison, he's sentenced to that prison which makes for a little bit of an awkward situation. Whenever he comes to the bridge, he says, how many of you did I sentence to this place? And there's a few hands that go up. Well, he wrote a book, a little tiny little book I have here. The book is entitled, From Fields to Courts by James Pierce. From fields, meaning tobacco fields, to corals. He writes, Entering the world as a result of promiscuity may not be ideal, but giving an opportunity to enter the world and live well is a gift from God. My life experience did not begin with an optimal set of circumstances. The facts and circumstances of how my mother and Willie Pierce conceived me are probably too salacious to discuss and better yet just left alone. I am fortunate because God had a plan to take a poor, rural, black child born out of wedlock into a judge for the 6th Judicial District of Pelham's County. Judge Pierce is a fine gentleman, a man of God, who is willing to leave his bench and speak to people in prison. But, but don't just hear that. Hear that. Where did he come from? He came from a family without a father. And yet he has become a father. And a good father. Your background, your background, maybe without a good, healthy father figure, but it doesn't have to stop you from developing a good relationship with your Heavenly Father. You too, you too can become a man or a woman of distinction despite dismal circumstances. And that's because your Father too has a plan for you. I pray that you'll take it seriously and not miss the program that you have for God and God for you. Thank you for listening this morning. God bless us all with a new vision of our Father's heart. Let's stand here. Let's
We bless you, Father, for being willing to listen to us and for calling us to talk to you and for being so patient with our idiosyncrasies, our failures, our mistakes, our omissions. Thank you, Lord, for how incredibly patient you are. There's some here who don't talk to you very much at all. Show yourself to them somehow this week and through the remainder months of this year. Show them your love. Bring you to their mind. And let this year be the year of a new relationship with you. Speaking to you. Talking to you. Letting them share their heart with you. Show them what a great father you are. If there's couples here who are having challenges, give them both grace, abundant grace, and mercy to begin sharing times together in prayer, preparing themselves for the difficult days that will not have. And for the fathers here, for whom this message also was meant, the dads, perhaps they're not setting a very good record. Perhaps they're not one that can be recommended due to various attitudes. Let this teaching about you and what kind of father you are and how Jesus recommended you, let it be a motivating factor and perhaps then changing course in the way they treat their wife, others, and their children not in a disrespectful, condescending way, but the treating of one as equals, with gentleness and love and forgiveness. Let this happen in every family, none excepting. And I will thank you, Father. And I pray in Christ's name. Right afterwards, for a bag of goodies, and moms and dads, you have total control over what I give them. But I'm trying to get good gifts. Things that are good for their teeth. Full of sugar and all those things, right? All right, let's leave with a blessing. Let's stand together for our blessing. You'll notice that it's taken from the passage we had a look at this morning, Luke 11. It's written for our, uh, our benefit, our help, our encouragement. There's a part for me and there's a part for you. That's the part called congregation. And then all also includes you. And if you wish, in the posture of receptivity, go ahead and follow along, speaking up and lifting up. And now may the Lord shape our vision of the Father in heaven and remind us that we are not strangers, but his sons and daughters. We don't have We don't have that. Um, you know what? Well, I've got it. Is that good enough? Yes. May he assure us that it is safe to ask him for our needs. Persuade us, Father, that you give good gifts to us. Motivate us to con converse with you throughout each day. And when we have begun to do these things, may you give us peace. Therefore, let us go forth today in confidence. Thanks be to God our Father. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Thank you. You are